episode 668. Book talk begins at 6 minutes and 32 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 668, Tech Wisdom. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com and our YouTube channel members on our YouTube channel, which is craftlet-channel. Today, we'd like to thank Claire Wade, Candace Funston, Jean Bates, Nicole Jordan, and Julia. Thank you so much for your support. These episodes would not be happening without you. you. I've had almost a good week. I think I actually now have averaged more good days than bad. As far as physical stuff goes, my brain is still not. It just is not. Andrew and I went out to dinner last night. Yeah, I went outside. And we were talking, and one of the things that I said was, I'm I'm glad that if this was going to have to happen, that it happened now. Because at this point, I feel like, you're not going to hate me if I am not able to research all the things and instead ask for you guys to fill in some of the blanks and you have. So thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for your patience. And, you know, just thank you for being awesome. A couple of highlights before we get into the book talk. Heirloom Knitting. Heirloom Knitting is the book that we're going to give away in... August. So what I'm doing is this is part of my de-stashing thing and I'm finding books that I've never used. I've never used and they're good books. So I thought, hi, I can send you a free book. So enter the raffle for an opportunity to do this. If you have other ideas about raffles, the things to do, because on a raffle copter, it's like you can sign up here and that's an entry and you can do this and that's an entry. There may be other things that we're missing or things that are kind of like no-brainers. Just leave us a message. In fact, I think on Rafflecopter, it gives you the opportunity to leave a message within the system. So if something is like, this is just not worth it, what are you? What about doing this? Please let us know. So that's up. Uh, the book for our book night this month is The Lore Gatherers. There is no audiobook to The Lore Gatherers by Jonathan Uffelman yet. But if you come to the book party and make a big deal about it, I'm sure we can probably get Jonathan to read perhaps his favorite passage, but also just nudge him with me because Jonathan being a fabulous actor really would do a lovely job reading his book. He's He's got a, day, he's got a very hard day job, uh, which is why it hasn't happened yet. But, you know, if he knows that people would like it, that, that might help. Premium books. Uh, by the time this goes live, Eric should have all of Bleak House up in the membership area on YouTube, which means I think we will have almost all the things, almost all the books that I've ever done as premium books. I think we only have a few more uh, to get up into the YouTube membership thing. So that is if you don't like Patreon, and I don't blame you because their setup is weird, that's okay. If you don't use the app or don't want to go through the rigmarole of having to sign up on a website browser in order to be able to get the the app to allow you to see the premium content. I understand that too. Those things are pains in the butt. They are sure making YouTube easy on this side of things to do. And of course, you know, half the time if I have YouTube on, I'm listening. I'm not watching it. I imagine most of us are the same way. We have We have other things we're doing with our eyes, which is why we're listening to this instead of reading. So YouTube has all these awesome goodies. We're going to, we are starting to use the community feed options there a little bit more. So you'll see messages going up Patreon, Facebook, and YouTube 
If you are paying for subscription anywhere and you aren't yet on the Discord server, please do let me know. Uh, we had a flurry of of conversating going on this last week about role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. And so I created a channel for RPG, all kinds, tabletop and uh, digital RPG games. So if you would like to talk to people about the campaigns that they have gone on that have been particularly good or their sources for good campaigns, that's a good place to to share because you know that the chances of something recommended by a craftlet person to another craftlet person means we run a good chance of everybody enjoying that. So share the wealth. We also have a live stream coming up on Sunday, August 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 Central, 2 Pacific. This is kind of the, the way to combat the Sunday afternoon ennui, to have a little discussion about Emma. We'll have not just me, we'll have other guests, and, uh, and we'll be putting up places for you to send in questions or comments that you would like shared. So this would be a bonus episode. So if you can't tune into the live stream, but you do have questions, go ahead and send them in. We'll answer them during the live stream, and then we will make the, the live stream into a bonus episode. So there's that. Okay, chapter four, which is actually chapter 40. So volume three, chapter four, we are losing in on the end. And the day that last episode went live, I was contacted by the, by the Romani ethnomusicologist expert. And we are trying to set up a time to talk this week. And I'll be able to record that and share that. If I talk to her far enough in advance of the day that this goes out, I will uh, put that that interview in this episode. If it takes too long, then it'll be a standalone as well. But either way, I have I have lots of questions and I I'm hoping that I can get some public domain music to play for you because it is really cool and interesting, which I mean it's not a surprise. But yeah, so that would talk about timing, huh? But it's good. It's good. She's very nice. She's also very busy. Everybody's busy in that world because it's summertime and so they're trying to get all their things done before they have to go back to school. Things to know about chapter 40 or volume three, chapter four. Tunbridge Wells. We have talked about Tunbridge Wells in Kent before. That is not news. We have mentioned it before. Lovely little spa town, beautiful, awesome, very much a tourist location, even back in Jane Austen's day. Not a surprise. What I didn't know about Tunbridge is that starting in the mid to late 1700s, there's a particular style of woodworking, inlaid woodworking. And we're going to have a picture if you are watching uh, YouTube. You'll see the picture on the screen. If you're listening, you can see this picture in the show notes. Tunbridge Ware. Tunbridge Ware boxes in particular. If you go looking this up, you'll see a lot of little sewing boxes that are adorable woodwork, but not really extraordinary. The I have a feeling that that's closer to the kind of Tunbridge Ware box we are going to be talking about in this chapter. But if you want to just have your mind blown, wow. It's like cables, color work, all of that stuff in knitting. It requires you to know what you're doing and to, to be paying attention. In Tarja, that fits where you are alternating colors in the same row, that is a level of skill that you have to pay attention for. These boxes look like intarsia on crack. Or if you've ever been to the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there's that one room, which I know I've mentioned on this podcast before, with inlaid. The walls of the room are inlaid perspective style wooden walls, making it look like you're inside a library with windows and doors and everything, but it's all inlaid wood. It is amazing. And if I can find a picture of that, that makes sense, because it's very hard to photograph that place and have it communicate what it actually is. If I can find a good one, I have not found it yet. I will also put that up on the screen or in the show notes. So Tunbridge Wells 
boxes were a thing. They still are a thing. They, uh, by the Regency period, they were absolutely a thing. They got real intricate during the Victorian era. Not a surprise. Court plaster. We now, in our modern day, would call it sticking plaster or a band aid. But I've always thought you know, sticking plaster is such an interesting name, especially if you grew up with just band aids. And band aids meant, I mean, when I was a kid, it wasn't even fabric strips. We are back to being able to get fabric strips. But for the longest time, it was just kind of like yicky plastic occasionally that had, you know, Big Bird on it if you were a kid, or Phineas and Ferb. I think I still have some Phineas and Ferb <laughs> band aids. I make no apologies. <laughs> but um, if you if you grew up in the States and those were your band-aids, sticking plaster sounds kind of odd because it sounds like you'd be sticking a sticky thing to a cut. And ew. Well, of course, you wouldn't be doing it exactly that way. You would put a piece of gauze or or fabric or something absorbent and then cover it with sticking plaster. And what sticking plaster actually used to be made of, no longer, it was little strips of silk or uh, taffeta, something that was was strong enough, but also flexible enough to be able to sort of hold its shape. But then it was coated on one side with a mixture of isinglass and glycerin. So glycerin, kind of sticky tacky, isinglass, depending on how it's treated, sticky tacky. And you combine those together and you get sticky, sticky tacky. And, and isinglass, I knew that sometimes isinglass referred to sheets of mica, thin sheets of mica that you could see through. I did not know that otherwise isinglass was made out of sturgeon, I think. For some reason, it has to be sturgeon, fish, air bladders. I don't know. I had kind of assumed it was a cartilaginous thing, like you'd cook down cartilage and use that because that could also be kind of flexible in a thin enough sheet. But no, no, apparently it's fish guts. Okay. But also genius, right? Because how do you create an adhesive when you don't have access to modern adhesives? This is why today's episode is called Tech Wisdom. When Andrew and I were out last night, we also talked about things that I've been learning because of working on the sewing machines. Things like, like how smart a design they are. Because, oh my goodness, these machines just flip in genius. But also that Singer sewing machine book or the Singer sewing book that I got, the 1949 version, it is paying off because there's all sorts of detailed information about finishing seams. And all these patterns that I get these days say, you know, seam this, seam allowance, blah, 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 finish seams however you want. And Bernadette Banner has shown me how to do full felled seam finishing. It, is that the right kind of finish to be using on this particular part of the outfit? I don't know. So it's been very, very helpful. But the other thing that I've learned, uh, not just from the book, but also from watching, uh, I think I think it was Stephanie Canada. It may have been. Maybe it was so Anastasia. It doesn't matter. Lots of people do this. Taylor Tax for doing darts. I never got into using the little stabity roller thing that you would use with carbon paper or sewing carbon paper, which was a huge tactical error on my part. I would have been a much better seamstress or sewist earlier on if I had used that the way God intended. But instead, uh, I was always trying to transfer those dots using a pen and you don't want the ink to go through. And if you're just using the erasable ink, it's not going to go through all the way anyway. And it had been a problem. All I needed to do was make a little hole in the pattern at the end of the dart and the beginnings of the darts. And then you take, I use upholstery thread just because it's easier to not accidentally pull it out. And you don't tie a knot. You 
go through the fabric, both layers of fabric, just at that tiny point, come back up through the fabric, turn your needle around, go back down through the fabric and up again and clip it. So now you have a loose kind of circle that cuts through both sides of the, the fabric, both, both two pieces that need to have matching darts. And what happens is once you finish cutting your piece out and you are ready to start stitching, you pull the layers apart just a little bit, just enough to be able to see those threads in between the, the two layers of fabric. And then you clip them right in the middle and the frayed ends of those two little loop-de-loop -loop things that you've created, they stay in place. They don't mar your fabric. And obviously, if, if you were using too big a needle or too thick a thread, it could leave a mark in your fabric, you know, depending on all those things. But otherwise, genius. And Andrew made a comment when I was saying, all this stuff is just so, wow, we have been so smart for so long. How did we not know this? Goes along with his, uh, his love of the book, Dawn of Everything. But he also said that this is an, an indicator of why people seem to be one, one of the many reasons why people seem to be having so much trouble, especially right now, coming off of a time when tech was the only way that we could communicate with each other at all and trying to put our lives back together again, all the burnout and everything. Part of it is over time because of apprenticeship programs and because of the fact that technology was not changing quickly, all of this kind of wisdom, not folk wisdom, not grandma said, but actual like tailors still use these techniques because they work. How do we know they work? Because they've been working for hundreds of years. Like a classical education, actually learning, rhetoric, writing, mathematics, science. There's a reason why, why the humanities are so important and why not having a good foundation in those things can put you in a, a bad place as an adult. There's going to be a lot of stuff you don't understand going on around you, and that, that stinks. But this idea of depth, you know, you, you build a deep, full understanding of whatever it is, a particular skill that you need to have. I understand my modern sewing machines now so much better simply because I've had to dismantle and remantle the, the singers. And, uh, and wow, they really are extraordinary. Super smart. Abby Cox did a really interesting video on the, the history of sewing machines and how Singer was not the guy who invented them. He's just the guy who knew how to market them and clearly did a fine job at that. But anyway, this idea of deep, skilled knowledge that was carried on for centuries in some cases made a lot of sense. We tend to think, oh, you know, these poor, simple people, they didn't know how to do anything. They didn't have our modern stuff. Well, they knew how to make a Band-Aid out of fish guts. So on us. But also the real point that Andrew was making was that tech is changing things so quickly. It's making it very hard for us to have any depth of knowledge. I think this is one of the reasons why we started. I know I'm not the only one who says it. I don't know if you've said it yourself, but I certainly have said, why is Google stupid all of a sudden? And the answer isn't because Google's AI or Google's search engines are bad or any worse than they used to be. The answer is there's more garbage out there and people don't know quality when they see it. So if Google is ranking things based on how many hits something is getting, chances are the first hits you're going to see are either sponsored or, if you're lucky, Wikipedia, because at least you can get sources from that, or something that's popular but not necessarily well-written or useful. So that's sad. But it also makes me really proud to be part of our larger community of people who do things and go to knitting circles and sit around and talk with each other and share techniques. That kind of learning is deep and, if you're lucky, broad and so good for our brains.
So it's just another way to say congratulations. You're awesome. That's all. So court plaster. Court plaster. Think Band-Aid. But really cool Band-Aid. Pen knives. We use the word pen knife all the time. I know I have. I didn't realize I was talking about a specific kind of knife that was used in order to trim the tips of quill pens. I've got a, a picture for you, a couple of pictures from Townsend. I can't remember the actual name of his channel, but Mr. Townsend does a lot of recreation. I think it's 18th century living. He's got a lovely YouTube channel. You know, he dresses up in the appropriate clothing and teaches you how to cook the way people used to cook and all that kind of stuff. He has a video that I know I mentioned a couple of years back during the pandemic on how to make and write with a quill pen. It was the moment when I realized this is something I am never going to be able to do. But two of the things I learned, it is not as simple as just taking a feather off of an animal and cutting the tip. The actual cutting is really precise and complicated. And the second thing I learned was, and if you didn't have a knife that was sharp enough, you were going to make it that much harder for yourself. <laughs> really hard. It needed to be very sharp. But by being really sharp, it also means you have to be really careful when you are using a pen knife. It's really, really easy to cut yourself. So just keep that in mind. And they were, you know, little folding knives. They were like, um, <laughs> not like a switchblade, but just like a little Girl Scout knife, you know, or a Swiss Army, little Swiss Army knife. All it had was a blade and that blade was kept very sharp. Spruce beer. I had to do some digging on this. Spruce beer is a kind of fermented, therefore slightly bubbly beer. So it's fermented. So it's, it's, I guess, technically considered a beer. It's also considered a beer because in order to get that fermentation, you have to use yeast. But the, the cone beds of the spruce tree, which is a evergreen tree, the little spruce buds, you'd take them and you would distill them kind of to get their essence. And then you would use that essence combined with water and molasses and then the the sweet yeast and let that ferment. I strain it off and bottle it. And apparently, and this will make it make even more sense when you get to this part of the chapter, apparently this was really good for people whose stomachs were off. And also very much an acquired taste. Not everybody liked this stuff, but is a diuretic. It holds its carbonation pretty well. I imagine with the molasses in there, it's it's gonna. Yeah, good for your stomach, especially they said in the summertime. It's a good summer drink. And I put good in air quotes because it also was, and not everybody had the taste for it. It was just not always, not always the most popular drink in the room. And that is it. All right, let's listen to chapter 40. Volume three, chapter four, or just plain old chapter 40 of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version of Emma, please fast wind to 35 minutes and five seconds. Volume three, chapter four. A very few days had passed after this adventure when Harriet came one morning to Emma with a small parcel in her hand, and after sitting down and hesitating, thus began. "'Miss Woodhouse, if you are at leisure, I have something that I should like to tell you, a sort of confession to make, and then, you know, it will be all over.' Emma was a good deal surprised, but begged her to speak. There was a seriousness in Harriet's manner which prepared her, quite as much as her words, for something more than ordinary. "'It is my duty, and I am sure it is my wish,' she continued, "'to have no reserves with you on this subject.' as I am happily quite an altered creature in one respect, it is very fit that you should have the satisfaction of knowing it. I do not want to say more than is necessary. I am too much ashamed of having given way as I have done, and I dare say you understand me. Yes, said Emma. I hope I do. How could I so long a time be fancying myself? cried Harriet warmly. It seems like madness— I can see nothing at all extraordinary in him now. I do not care whether I meet him or not. 
except that of the two I had rather not see him, and indeed I would go any distance round to avoid him. But I do not envy his wife in the least. I neither admire her nor envy her, as I have done. She is very charming, I dare say, and all that, but I think her very ill-tempered and disagreeable. I shall never forget her look the other night. However, I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, I wish her no evil. No, let them be ever so happy together. It will not give me another moment's pang. And to convince you that I have been speaking truth, I am now going to destroy what I ought to have destroyed long ago, what I ought never to have kept. I know that very well, blushing as she spoke. However, now I will destroy it all, and it is my particular wish to do it in your presence, that you may see how rational I am grown. Cannot you guess what this parcel holds? said she, with a conscious look. Not the least in the world. Did he ever give you anything? No, I cannot call them gifts, but they are things that I have valued very much. She held the parcel towards her, and Emma read the words, Most Precious Treasures, on the top. Her curiosity was greatly excited. Emma unfolded the parcel, and she looked on with impatience. Within abundance of silver paper was a pretty little Tunbridge ware box, which Harriet opened. It was well lined with the softest cotton, but excepting the cotton, Emma saw only a small piece of court plaster. Now, said Harriet, you must recollect. No, indeed, I do not. Dear me, I should not have thought it possible you could forget what passed in this very room about court plaster, one of the very last times we ever met in it. It was but a very few days before I had my sore throat, just before Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley came, I think the very evening. Do you not remember his cutting his finger with your new penknife, and your recommending court plaster? But as you had none about you, and knew I had, you desired me to supply him, and so I took out mine and cut him a piece, but it was a great deal too large, and he cut it smaller, and kept playing some time with what was left, before he gave it back to me. And so then, in my nonsense, I could not help making a treasure of it. So I put it by never to be used, and looked at it now and then as a great treat. "'My dearest Harriet,' cried Emma, putting her hand before her face and jumping up, "'you make me more ashamed of myself than I can bear. Remember it? Ay, I remember it all now, all except your saving this relic. I knew nothing of that till this moment.' but he cutting a finger, and my recommending court plaster, and saying I had none about me. Oh, my sins! my sins! And I had plenty all the while in my pocket! One of my senseless tricks! I deserve to be under a continual blush all the rest of my life! Well, sitting down again, go on, what else? And had you really some at hand yourself? I am sure I never suspected it, you did it so naturally! "'And so you actually put this piece of court plaster by for his sake?' said Emma, recovering from her state of shame and feeling divided between wonder and amusement, and secretly she added to herself, "'Lord bless me! When should I ever have thought of putting by in cotton a piece of court plaster that Frank Churchill had been pulling about? I never was equal to this!' resumed Harriet, turning to her box again. "'Here is something still more valuable.' I mean, that has been more valuable, because this is what really once did belong to him, which the court plaster never did. Emma was quite eager to see this superior treasure. It was the end of an old pencil, the part without any lead. This was really his, said Harriet. Do not you remember one morning? No, I dare say you do not. But one morning, I forget exactly the day, but perhaps it was the Tuesday or Wednesday before that evening. He wanted to make a memorandum in his pocket-book. It was about spruce beer. Mr. Knightley had been telling him something about brewing spruce beer, and he wanted to put it down, but when he took out his pencil, there was so little lead that he soon cut it all away, and it would not do, so you lent him another, and this was left upon the table as good for nothing. But I kept my eye on it, and as soon as I dared, caught it up, and never parted with it again from that moment. I do remember it cried Emma. I perfectly remember it, talking about spruce beer. Oh, yes, Mr. Knightley and I both saying we liked it, and Mr. Elton seeming resolved to learn to like it, too. I perfectly remember it. Stop! Mr. Knightley was standing just here, was not he? I have an idea he was standing just here. Ah, I do not know. I cannot recollect. It is very odd, but I cannot recollect. Mr. Elton was sitting here, I remember, much about where I am now. Well, go on. "'Oh, that's all. I have nothing more to show you or to say. 
except that I am now going to throw them both behind the fire, and I wish you to see me do it. My poor dear Harriet, and have you actually found happiness in treasuring up these things? Yes, simpleton as I was, but I am quite ashamed of it now, and wish I could forget as easily as I can burn them. It was very wrong of me, you know, to keep any remembrances after he was married. I knew it was, but had not resolution enough to part with them. But, Harriet, is it necessary to burn the court plaster? I have not a word to say for the bit of old pencil, but the court plaster might be useful. I shall be happier to burn it, replied Harriet. It has a disagreeable look to me. I must get rid of everything. There it goes, and there is an end, thank heaven, of Mr. Elton. And when, thought Emma, will there be a beginning of Mr. Churchill? She had soon afterwards reason to believe that the beginning was already made, and could not but hope that the gypsy, though she had told no fortune, might be proved to have made Harriet's. About a fortnight after the alarm, they came to a sufficient explanation, and quite undesignedly. Emma was not thinking of it at the moment, which made the information she received more valuable. She merely said, in the course of some trivial chat, "'Well, Harriet, whenever you marry I would advise you to do so and so.' and thought no more of it, till after a minute's silence she heard Harriet say in a very serious tone, "'I shall never marry.' Emma then looked up, and immediately saw how it was, and after a moment's debate as to whether it should pass unnoticed or not, replied, "'Never marry? This is a new resolution.' "'It is one that I shall never change, however.' After another short hesitation, "'I hope it does not proceed from—I hope it is not in compliment to Mr. Elton.' "'Mr. Elton, indeed!' cried Harriet indignantly. "'Oh, no!' and Emma could just catch the words. "'So superior to Mr. Elton!' She then took a longer time for consideration. Should she proceed no farther? Should she let it pass and seem to suspect nothing? Perhaps Harriet might think her cold or angry if she did, or perhaps if she were totally silent it might only drive Harriet into asking her to hear too much— and against anything like such an unreserve as it had been, such an open and frequent discussion of hopes and chances, she was perfectly resolved. She believed it would be wiser for her to say and know at once all that she meant to say and know. Plain dealing was always best. She had previously determined how far she would proceed on any application of the sort, and it would be safer for both to have the judicious law of her own brain laid down with speed. She was decided, and thus spoke. Harriet, I will not affect to be in doubt of your meaning. Your resolution, or rather your expectation of never marrying, results from an idea that the person whom you might prefer would be too greatly your superior in situation to think of you. Is not it so? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, believe me, I have not the presumption to suppose—indeed I am not so mad. But it is a pleasure to me to admire him at a distance, and to think of his infinite superiority to all the rest of the world, with the gratitude, wonder, and veneration which are so proper, in me especially. I am not at all surprised at you, Harriet. The service he rendered you was enough to warm your heart. Service! Oh, it was such an inexpressible obligation! The very recollection of it— and all that I felt at the time, when I saw him coming, his noble look, and my wretchedness before. Such a change, in one moment such a change, from perfect misery to perfect happiness. It is very natural. It is natural and it is honourable. Yes, honourable, I think, to choose so well and so gratefully. But that it will be a fortunate preference is more than I can promise. I do not advise you to give way to it, Harriet. I do not by any means engage for its being returned. Consider what you are about. Perhaps it will be wisest in you to check your feelings while you can. At any rate, do not let them carry you far, unless you are persuaded of his liking you. Be observant of him. Let his behaviour be the guide of your sensations. I give you this caution now, because I shall never speak to you again on the subject. I am determined against all interference. Henceforward I know nothing of the matter. Let no name ever pass our lips. We were very wrong before we will be cautious now. He is your superior, no doubt, and there do seem objections and obstacles of a very serious nature. But yet, Harriet, more wonderful things have taken place. There have been matches of greater disparity. But take care of yourself. I would not have you too sanguine, though, however it may end, be assured your raising your thoughts to him is a mark of good taste, which I shall always know how to value."
Harriet kissed her hand in silent and submissive gratitude. Emma was very decided in thinking such an attachment no bad thing for her friend. Its tendency would be to raise and refine her mind, and it must be saving her from the danger of degradation. End of chapter 4 all right, so it was a short chapter, and one of the reasons why we only did one today is because, again, there's a tonal shift next week with, with next week's chapter. I didn't want to muddy the waters. This scene is a particularly famous one. It's also one that is done to perfection in Clueless. And in fact, we're going to play you a couple minutes of the clip from Clueless. So if you've never seen it before, just know that Harriet is named Ty. And boy, you can tell she sounds like she's from Brooklyn. And then you have our, our Emma stand-in uh, that Alicia Silverstone is playing, Cher. And this is what their scene sounds like in modern day. It's my hips, isn't it? No, of course not. Don't be stupid. You could do so much better. He no. thinks he's all that, Ty. Yeah, God's gift. You're too good for him. If I'm too good for him, then how come I'm not with him? <sighs> I have got an idea. Let's blow off 7th and 8th, go to the mall... Have a calorie fest and see the new Christian Slater. Yes. Oh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, baby. Oh, break me off a piece of that. <laughs> oh. Survey says? Sewable. <laughs> Puny. I like them big. Ooh, I hate muscles. I mean, I don't really care either way. Oh. Um. Just as long as his you-know-what isn't crooked. I really hate that. What? Shh. Don't scare her. What? What's wrong? Cher is saving herself for Luke Perry. Cher, you're a virgin? Oh, God. What's wrong, Ty? They're playing our song. The one that Alan and I dance to. Oh. Rolling with Toby. Oh, oh, Ty. Don't cry. I'm sorry. So embarrassing. No, no one saw. Okay. Now all night long, I'm gonna be known as that girl who fell on her butt. Ty, no one noticed. Wow, yeah. are you okay? That looked really bad. Yeah, thanks. I gotta tell you something. I'm really sorry about your testimony. Yeah. I am so glad you're here. There's something I've gotta do, and I really need you here with me while I do it. Does this thing work? Oh, yeah. What is this stuff? This is a bunch of junk that reminded me of Elton, but I wanna burn it because I am so over him. What's the... All right. Do you remember when we were at the vow party and the clog knocked me out and Elton ran and got a towel of ice to cure me? Yeah. Well, I didn't tell you at the time, but I took the towel home as a souvenir. <laughs> You're kidding. No. <laughs> and then... Do you remember that song that was playing when we danced? Remember that? You know, the rolling with the homies? Um... Anyways, anyways, I got the tape right. I listen to it like every single night. <laughs> Don't run that, okay? Ty, I'm really happy for you, but what brought on this surge of empowerment? It's like I met this guy who's so totally amazing. Then he makes Alton look like a loser. That is so great. <laughs> so I, I thought that was just genius. The idea. First off, the idea of the towel and the not mixtape. She actually, it wasn't even a mixtape. He didn't even give her a mixtape. She went out and bought the cassette tape and she's kind of shaking it in her hand, which you can hear even if you're just listening to the audio. But the funny thing is she's about to put it into a fireplace for realsies. And Cher's like, don't burn that, which is modern. You shouldn't be burning plastic like that in the fireplace. So it's, the whole thing is modernized so beautifully. But what I particularly liked was because this is a movie, they had to make Cher slash Emma's question a little bit more overt than it is in the book. You know, like, what brought this change in you? What made you decide that you could get rid of this stuff? First off, heartbreaking. And I know, I know people make fun of Harriet for this scene. 
I'm going to stand up for Harriet. We all wind up saving things that mean something to us that other people would look at us and just go, wow, that's like saving the fingernails of saints. What are you doing? It matters. The things that matter to us matter to us. And these are really sad little things. I mean, it it makes sense why this would have thrown Emma a bit. Like, oh my God, you really, you poor, sweet, innocent thing who isn't even as aware as Charlotte Lucas is in, in Pride and Prejudice. She's just sweet. And she's not the only person in this book who's kept things that are kind of weird. Way back at the beginning of the book, Mr. Knightley kept the one of the reading lists that Emma made of all the books she wanted to read that she, of course, never did because there was no craft lit for her. But he kept that. And he's not stupid or he's not somebody who conventional wisdom could slander the way they do Harriet as being particularly dim. Harriet is simple and innocent in all of the best meanings of the word. There is not a cynical bone in her body, but she's also not Pollyanna. You know, she's not, everything is, is peaches and unicorns and rainbows. Life is not always easy. Things can get tough and she's well aware of it and she knows what she's up against. But Emma also in this scene is trying so hard not to meddle. She is convinced that Harriet is after Frank Churchill, but she is not going to get into a conversation about that. She, they are not going to mention the names. La, 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 la. I am not listening to you. And Emma really is trying to have learned her lesson. Will this work out for her? No. No, it will not. But that doesn't matter yet. Because the important thing is she is absolutely making the attempt to do the right thing and, and have learned from her, her talks that she had with, uh, especially with Knightley. I also thought it was very interesting that while Harriet remembered the things, the little stories about the, the pencil, cutting yourself with the pen knife and needing the, the court plaster, the sticking plaster, she remembered the things, she kept the things. Emma also remembered the conversation, the spruce beer conversation. But what, what did she remember? Where Knightley was st standing. Right? This is, this is the fabulous part about Jane Austen's writing. She is leaving breadcrumbs for all of us all the way along because there have been a lot of breadcrumbs so far. But now they're getting more and more obvious. Obvious to us, if not obvious to Emma yet. But yes, I thought that was, that was just lovely. I found it hard to listen to the part where Harriet's like, I am never going to marry. Because that's, those are Emma's words coming out of Harriet's mouth. And while you were used to Harriet repeating the things like about Elton during the first volume of the book, this is different. This is something that could really affect her badly for the rest of her life. Uh, we don't know how much money she would have to live on on her own as, a, as an adult woman. All we know is that she's being paid for right now. We've got no more information than that, and neither does she. And Emma has the luxury of being able to say, I'm never going to marry. She doesn't need to. As we know for other women, if you didn't, make a good match that was bad match equals hard life period there were no ways no ways around it so yeah harriet's idolizing of emma kind of bearing that part of her soul to emma i thought was really important and also really good that emma was horrified by it and tried to you know talk her off that ledge and um and pull her back to a more tenable position to hold. So it's a it's a sweet chapter. It's a short chapter. Um, <laughs> and the clueless scene. Mwah. Chef's kiss. So perfect. And we get a, another tonal change for next week. All right. I'm going to leave it there. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes.
thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.